Welcome or welcome back. This is Pairs Wealth Knitting. I'm Jennifer and this is a knitting podcast all about knitting, yarny adventures and travel. Thank you so much as always for joining me today. I'm thrilled that you're here. We are sharing part one of Norway. My love, my love, my life and I just got back from Norway um, last week and I have been just jazzed to be sharing about all of the tidbits of our adventures. Um, I want to share about why we chose this, where we went, what we did. There was so much that I have to chunk it up into parts. So this is part one and this episode will mostly and only feature Oslo. In the future, we will be featuring Stravanger Ambergen and one adventure we had. Um, I also want to say thank you for joining me if you have for the one year of Pears Wall Knitting podcast anniversary. Thank you very much. Um, technically, this is my 43rd episode, I believe. Uh, the Pears Well, Pears well with Knitting um, one year <clears throat> was a 42nd episode, which that's incredible to me. It's also incredible it's been one year. Um, if you haven't checked out that episode yet, I very much invite you to go check it out. There's a giveaway there. If you haven't already entered, please do so. Maybe you can win a little fun prize um, to celebrate the podcast. So thank you. Um, The second takeaway from that is a big thank you to everyone that commented. So generous with your kind words. So thank you so much for that. Um, I feel so lucky that I'm here and that you're here with me. Um, I feel like we have the most beautiful, kind community and thrilled that we can all do this Um, virtually. I'm thrilled as well. If I have met you in person, amazing. Um, I also want to say a big thank you for the encouragement that I received from many of you about recording. Um, I did share some initiative that I want to have for next year moving forward for when I return back to teaching and knowing that I will not have all of this divine time to be recording scene after or like shot after shot after shot um, which I've had the luxury of doing this year. So I feel like you haven't seen the true glitches um, and the tongue ties and things that I have, which is human. Um, but I know in the classroom, I don't have control with kind of, you know, allowing for those mistakes not to be seen. Here I do. I have that control. I take so much time to edit. And if you are not knowing about filming and podcasting and editing, you do not need to. I'm just saying it takes a long time. And so the encouragement was to go raw. We're going hopefully from front to back um, within one shot one day. And so this will be minimal editing, which I really want to try. So what I'm asking of you very kindly, let me know. Let me know your feedback, um, if this is working for you, if it's not. And I'll have to move forward with a plan of either continuing on with this method or going with the editing version And I'll just have to make some mods to see what's going to work best for me for when I return. So please let me know how you're you're going to find this. Um, All right. We are going to bounce in to the Norway trip. First of all, Norway was always on the list for the love of my life and I to visit one day. We didn't know when that day was going to be. And luckily this year, with having the whole year of sabbatical off, um, we were really able, I think, to dig deep into where we wanted to go. We usually are travelers anyway, but this really allowed us, I think, to not feel as restricted with timing and dates because my job is very much dictating when we can go away. With Norway, we felt like obviously the summer was the best time and I felt very like naughty but good. We were able to go right before school finished um, for our academic calendar year. So technically we were already in Norway by this time school was stopping here in Ontario, which was really nice as a teacher thinking, oh, I'm already, I'm already out there. Um, so that was awesome. We chose Norway as well because of the scenery. We are such a lover of mountains and ocean, two things that we do not have here in Toronto, um, coupled with lovely people, the culture, and of course, yarny goodness. This is the motherland of knitting, sheep, yarn. I mean, and it was absolutely everything that I think we have both dreamed of. So, um, so let me go over all of it. This is also heavy. 
So Oslo is the capital of Norway, the biggest city in Norway, and down in the south of the country of the, they call it the lamb chop. So right down in there. And we could not get a direct flight from Toronto. So we flew from Pearson, Toronto to Montreal to Stockholm and then Oslo. It sounds complicated and gruesome kind of with all the plane rides. It wasn't that bad. Um, I feel like I've done way worse and um, the flights were pretty much on time. I mean, it was no big deal. We're, I think we're avid travelers as well. And we travel with carry on only, which if you haven't seen, check out the traveling video for packing. I did a carry on only video and I only travel with carry on and my me made makes with knitting. Um, we got to Oslo. I had slept on the plane, uh, which was like the first time ever. I had a flight plan that I coupled a little bit of wine with some, uh, some items. So it helped me sleep for the first time ever. And I have to say it made all the difference. However, it was very groggy the first day. So the first day in also was a bit of a wash for me, but beautiful. We actually were told that we had brought the sun to also, they had had a lot of rain and dull and great for us because we have had a lot of rain here in the city like all year. So that was a great start. Um, I will go through and I made tons of notes to help me along. Um, I'll go through kind of what I did in a day to chunk it. So if you ever are curious about going or kind of want to get a sense of kind of the, the districts or whatever that might be helpful, this might even inspire you to maybe adventure out of your comfort zone and do different traveling, different style of traveling. So often when I travel, <clears throat> the love of my life and I will make a spreadsheet. Um, it'll include all of the flight details, of course, the accommodations, but then also what we're interested in or if we have additional bookings that are coming up. So sometimes we'll book a special dinner, we'll include that reservation into the spreadsheet. Um, and then to get us all excited and slightly organized, um, we'll include places we wanna go or activities. So it was chucked full of yarn shops of Oslo because that could be a whole adventure of itself. Um, coffee is always a really big thing for me when we go away. I love visiting different cafes and coffee shops, roasteries. Um, also was obviously not a disappointment at all. They're big coffee culture there. Um, yeah, so let's get in. So day one, again, this is like chunking. Uh, we did a beautiful walk along the river. Of course, I forgot to write down the river name, um, but it's right in the city center and reach out if you have any questions about it. We walked first to uh, Tim Wendelbo Cafe. Uh, Tim Wendelbo, if you are not knowing and not into super coffee culture, um, he is a massive award winner barista. He had one and let me just check my notes because I don't want to get his uh, awards wrong. He has many. Uh, he has won the Barista Championship in Scandinavia many times, uh, but he also opened the world's best roastery uh, that won in 2013. The cafe is called Tim uh, Wendelbull. Uh, cafe or window bow cafe uh, just note if you are ever going uh, reach out let me know and I'm really excited to share with you there's two locations one is a cafe location and one seems to be an office um, we went to the cafe location and uh, yeah I, I, I don't think the office option serves I think it's literally just the office um, but they are this um, coffee shop this cafe is a roastery espresso bar coffee training and they also include monthly subscriptions so this technically is the best place to go to for coffee um, and also you know from a guy that has won multiple times of best barista internationally as well. Amazing. Um, so we went there. I had had a latte at this point. I always forget because I'm a flat white girl. When I go overseas or to other coffee shops that I don't know, uh, sometimes flat white isn't always on the menu. So I go latte and then it's such, it's such a different experience. I won't get into all the coffee bit. Um, it was good. It was not the best coffee I've ever had. It was also not the best coffee in Norway I ever had. So again, if you are feeling very strongly about this cafe, let me know. Um, I might have missed the mark and maybe I didn't ask for the right bean or maybe the latte just wasn't for me in general. 
it was interesting. I was really excited we went. It's a beautiful place, um, but wasn't my very favorite. Um, Love My Life doesn't drink coffee. He's a tea drinker. They only had herbal tea. They also have no baked goods there. So if you were going, just expect the coffee from what I've seen and <laughs> what I experienced that day. Side note, um, interesting and again this is like a beautiful cultural difference we were sitting outside it was hot it was almost like 30 degrees out the cafe in itself with the seating area is quite tiny so they have benches on the outside no tables again super minimal that's the whole feel of this cafe roastery is that you're there for the coffee enjoyment of the coffee not for anything else and I was sitting down with the love of my life, enjoying the sipping of the latte, chatting, you know, this is technically day one that we're in Oslo. And I look beside me and there's a little cart, like a pram, a baby pram. Again, this was, you know, part of the city. This is what happens, not so much downtown Toronto, but in all of the cities that we visit in Norway, babies were very present, little babies. There was a baby in the pram beside me with no mommy around. and. Again, this is so not here um, that they felt perfectly fine. The It was a whole family. It was like grandma, I'm, I'm assuming, and a friend or a sister. Felt great to go order coffee, allow the baby to sleep, which is amazing, and then come back out with the coffee to the baby who was still sleeping. <laughs> it was amazing. I love it. I mean, this country, glorious, glorious. Um, so that was the Tim... Uh, Wendebo Cafe. Beautiful. Um, we then ventured on, I feel like my light's changing of course with the time of day, uh, we ventured on into the Yarny Adventure. So in this area we continued past, did lots of walking obviously in Oslo, very walkable city. I'll give you some breakdown and down low about that in a moment. Um, we went to Fru uh, Kif, Kifst, uh, and that is one of two yarn shops. I'll talk about the yarn shop. I'm going to talk about my yarny purchases and uh, So exciting. So this yarn shop was on my map. It was on actually it's a different name They had recently taken this shop over within the past year, but oddly Google map hadn't updated with the new name uh, Fru uh, Kvist is one of two locations like i said there's a downtown location which i did visit but this location was out in gruno loca laca and um in like a hipper uh, area of the city not as busy um but vibrant vivacious it was lots of fun cafes and restaurants there um walked in love my life hung outside in the park in the shade because it was hot and i had the best time in there and again Going to the country, knowing I was only going to do carry on, not try to check baggage. I left a smidge, I mean, I'm talking a smidge of room in my backpack. So I had to be really mindful about what I was purchasing. Um, they had all kinds of beautiful wool in there. Um, very, you'll, you'll see like mainstream Norwegian yarns were there. They had Rama, uh, so um, Rama Garn which is a uh, very local Norwegian yarn. Um, I've used Roma Fino before. This was all over the place, but obviously tons of different bases that we do not have access to directly in stores in Toronto. Um, they have tons of Sandus. Sandus Garn obviously is a Norwegian brand, and I think if it's not the biggest international yarn brand, it's definitely the biggest Norwegian yarn brand, but I'm pretty sure it's the biggest international one. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, other big Norwegian brands that they had uh, were, I should say, um, independent uh, yarn brand they had that I recognized was Hillsvog. I really tried to pump the brakes when I was on, in Oslo for all the Hillsvog yarn. I was like a kid in a candy shop and just like, you know, squishing and sniffing and wanted to buy everything, but I was going to the mill. You're going to be seeing an upcoming episode all about his vlog and that experience because it was fabulous. So didn't do that. What I did buy is, and I'll show you this. This I purchased from the Fruk uh, Quist uh, shop. This is, and I don't want to say anything wrong, uh, Storm, the base is Storm, and it's by Lofo Ten Wool. Uh, this is 
a beautiful Norwegian wool. Um, I'm going to tell you all about it because I did a little more poking around, of course. Uh, this was recommended actually by the chicky poo that worked in the shop as one of the but more like local um, national yarn brands. Um, very small um, and they do ship internationally apparently, uh, but I was immediately intrigued. I mean, they had all natural colors there um, of the like gray, gray browns. They had a cream. Um, they also had dyed options and I'm really gravitating. I know it's crazy because you're like, oh my gosh, you always do the loud bright colors and I do, um, but I'm really gravitating when it's like this kind of like really rustic oozing like farm to hand yarn. I'm going for this like gorgeous natural sheepy color. So this base is classified as a bulky and I mean the smell is real like there's sheepy goodness in here I bought three of these um this is a combo of and I did it I did look of it's the old Norse sheep so this is um an original uh sheep breed uh Norwegian sheep breed Norse means Norwegian Norsk is Norway I did learn this and I'm forgetting because you know it's been a whole week and the brain just goes bloop um, this is a blend of an adult, um, old Norse sheep and lamb. So you're getting the softness from the lamb, but the real like rustic and, um, like hardy quality from the adult sheep. And it's just stunning. I cannot wait. I bought three skeins. I wanted actually to get a full sweater quantity, but again, I'm like pumping the brakes because I knew there was going to be more yarn. This was my first yarn shop visit. I mean, oh, I was in love. Um, this company, this yarn company, I should say farm, is uh, Lofoten Wool, which is located in the north of Norway on the islands. Um, they, hold on, sorry. <laughs> We're not editing, we're reading, and I'm making sure I'm not catching anything or missing anything. Um, sorry. So this is in the north of Norway, in the Lofoten Islands. Um, they, so again, it's the mix of the gray lamb's wool and wool from the Old Norse sheep, as I said. What they also do is they do, I guess, a shearing. They called it a crop was the translation, but I think it's shearing. Um, I think annually... Oh my gosh, I should probably do this, but I don't. Look at me making it up. Once a year, they shear their sheep. And there is a date, like an, um, uh, what's it called? Year. It was like, I don't know, a year that is on each label. The year allows this to like, it's vintage. So um, it's like wine. They refer to it like wine, where it's when we think about wine uh, consumption, that we refer to years or vintages um, with the year. So we're like, oh, vintage, you know, 1997. It's the same idea, but with yarny goodness. So this is from 2021. And they say, which makes sense that every shearing is, has different qualities or different characteristics. So I feel like, of course, this makes sense to me when we're not getting that massively produced yarn, that it is very unique to that year uh, with the growth of the wool that happened. Maybe with the sheep were fed, what they, you know, what they grazed on. It could be with the weather. I actually learned about this in um, the spinning seminar that I took where they were talking about the staple length and all that. I won't go into it. Um, but this is exactly what I thought about. I thought, you know, 2021, this was what the sheep had on their bodies. And this is a result of their environment. And I just thought, this is so, this is so good. Like this is, this is definitely farm to hand. I do not know what to knit with this yet. Um, if you have an idea, let me know. Uh, it is a 100 grams. It's 130 meters per 100 grams. I don't know three skeins. I kind of, this was not in the knitting intentions that I had of purchases. I did have some, you're going to see coming up, 
this was something that jumped at me and I did not have a plan. So if you have an idea of what I can knit with these three stunning rustic yarns from the Lofton Islands of Norway, shout out, let me know. Um, I'm thinking maybe some kind of like shruggy thing, maybe a vest. I don't think I can get a vest out of this. Like it's technically, what is it? Three, 400 ish, almost 400 meters. I don't know. We'll see. Um, this was a highlight of uh, this area, the uh, Gruno Loka area. We are interrupting today's podcast with a special announcement. This announcement is in paid partnership with Teddy Blake. Teddy Blake is a leather goods company located in New York that prepare fine Italian leather goods in Italy and they graciously gifted me this beautiful handbag. Today's announcement is to share that they're celebrating their ninth year anniversary and are having a huge sale. Their ninth anniversary sale begins July 19th until July 25th, where you can find handbags as inexpensive as $185. I highly encourage you to check it out because I feel the quality of the handbag is fantastic. In specific, this is the Kate Vitello bag in black. It is one of their largest bags and I feel like it is just perfect for me. It is something that I'm looking forward to as I go back to work with my return, but I have already used for a number of interviews. It is large enough with the expandable features that I was able to fit my laptop along with everything else I was bringing to the interview. And because of course I'm using public transportation and walking everywhere and hustling, of course, um, I'm not only using the small handle that is on the top here, which I think is already a cute look, but I've been using the shoulder strap as a crossbody bag that really allows me to move quickly around the city. I have to say I'm really impressed with this bag in general and feel so happy that this is the bag I picked. I feel it is a classic. Um, so I invite you to use the code with the link below um, so you can peruse and enjoy the sale that Teddy Blake is having. We're going to get back into the episode. We finished off the day by stopping at the fortress. There's a fortress in the center of Oslo. I, I would call it the center, um, called the Acres House, uh, Acres House maybe. And that is the original fort of the city center. Um, I've got a little blurb about that. So it's the, it, they've low, they picked the location for the fort as all forts do because it's great vision of possible enemies that would come in so they can protect their kingdom, their castle, their land. Um, and they chose the innermost part of the fjord. The fjords are essentially waterways that go in and out of the land. Um, stunning, beautiful. Uh, it was built in, the walls were built in 1624, but there were many other buildings within the fort that were built much earlier. And the castle <clears throat> that was built in the Middle Ages in Norway were, was in the 1300s. Uh, so, and at the time it was called Christiana. Uh, so it was protecting, that fort was protecting that royaume, uh, what's it called? Kingdom kingdom. <clears throat> um, today, the fortress is accessible to public with no fee. You can walk through and it's beautiful to look at. Um, there is a museum where I believe you do have to pay, but we didn't hit that at the right time. And visitor center at as well serves as a concert venue. Side note, in the evening after we would get home, uh, I should say, to the hotel after long days on our feet and had had dinner and a cocktail and all these beautiful little things as we do. Um, there was always a little Norwegian sing-along. It sounds, it sounds so fairy tale. Um, that was on the television. And there was very little English um, on the TV show. I didn't even talk about the generals of Norway, but I will. Um, so we would tune in to this sing-along, Norwegian sing-along, where I think most of the songs were in Norwegian. Um, 
And at first we tuned in because it was kind of funny. It was like, oh, they're doing a sing along. It was all families and very like crazy wholesome. And we started recognizing some of the locations around also where the concerts would be. And I'm guessing these were pre-filmed, although it did look like we actually walked by one that was possibly being filmed um, the night before. And we started doing this every night upon return. And it became kind of like, you know, a little fun, like, you know, vacation after the day is done, simmering down moment. And we loved kind of the people watching of it. Anyway, it's just like, it's just a wholesome country. We love, we love. Um, I do want to make note now, before I get into the day two component of Norway, because I'm not refilming, um, I'll share some of the Norway generalities that we found. So first of all, English is present. I think it is the first not English, first country we've been to where we've had as much English as we did, if that makes sense. So often when we travel, there will be another language, of course, that is the official language of the country or a number of official languages. And English is known by people, um, obviously more in city center than not. And often we try our best <laughs> to get by with some words and polite phrases to help us get through whatever it is in order or directions. This was full English. Everyone that we had encountered, city or not, spoke English and probably spoke English better than most North Americans. Um, it was very impressive. Uh, all of the menus and everything written, uh, there was some English component. Translation might not have been 100% for what we're used to. It, there was no problem communicating. It was, it was very surprising. It was surprising. It was very nice. Um, but I do have to say as someone who I think enjoys trying the challenge of saying different words in the home language of where we're going, I don't think I learned any new words. I mean, I knew some knitting terms only from being in social media with knitting. It was, it was very different. Um, appreciated, but very surprising. So English was everywhere for sure. Um, other interesting uh, things to note were prices. We were warned, and after all the research I did, of course, um, knowing that prices would be not not inexpensive, um, prices are very, I would say, fair. You are paying for products, you're paying for services, and over in Norway, it's a highly socialist system, so people are getting paid at fair prices, unlike North America, where we have a, a big sliding scale of what is acceptable. The love of my life is on the phone. We're still gonna try to roll with it. I hope it's okay. Um, so costs can be down as well. A big difference was a lot of things. So um, products or other items that were produced, I guess as products, um, food is, as local as it can be. That is, of course, because you're paying for that thing to be prepared by someone that's getting paired a fair wage, um, makes it more expensive than here, where we're getting products and things in from countries where people are not paid fairly. They do not have health care. So I have to say, one, if you're considering going to Norway, know that you're going to be paying a fair price. But I feel also it's nice to know that you're getting services and products that are you're paying for the quality of what you're consuming. And and it's it's being a part of a social system where people are getting paid fairly and have health care and benefits. I mean, to me. This is amazing and I very much am here for that. Um, I hope you feel that way too. Uh, so yes, things were expensive and everything from items for purchasing, which I didn't purchase, I don't think anything outside of yarn, um, but clothing, uh, not inexpensive, food, 
is in not expensive. The interesting part with drinks, if I may, um, drinks on a menu, so these are alcoholic drinks. We knew, we've been told, like they're astronomical. I think a lot of the prices coming from the downtown core of Toronto, they were not exceptional compared to what we're used to. There were some funny differences with like beer and wine. Um, here in Toronto, you can get a pint of beer for like, I don't know, 10 Canadian dollars maybe, depending where you are. Um, a glass of wine can range from like 16 to $25, depending what you're getting. Um, over in Norway, wine and beer is pretty much the same. So we were converting a lot, or I was at least, because I like knowing um, how much things were in the Canadian conversion um, of the Norwegian kroner, uh, the knock they call it. And uh, beer and wine was similar. So if you were, you know, ever like swayed with prices, have what you want because you're paying for it anyway. Um, apple cider was a big thing over there as well. Uh, they really pride themselves on beautiful quality apple cider. This is alcoholic cider and as well it's the same price as beer and wine whereas over here we have lots of you know apple cider that we consume and it's quite you know inexpensive compared to these things very on par with beer prices and beer is inexpensive here those are interesting things um the city also super incredibly walkable i walked everywhere I don't think I use public transit except for to and from the airport. We never rent cars when we go away to Western Europe. We really rely on public transportation and you can there absolutely. Um, the thing with cars as well, we noticed right away there was very little car movement or little cars period that were in the city center. It was very odd. You could look down the grid of the street at a four way stop with lights nobody would be around no cars just pedestrians it was it was very odd it had an odd sense in the beginning because I didn't fully understand I thought you know it's a weekday like where's everybody you're gonna see in my day two it all came together and I figured out why there weren't a lot of cars there this is all speculation this is from my observations Yarn. Yarn is available across the country, of course, um, in every city we went to. It is, there are a plethora of gorgeous yarn shops that are curated just fabulously and you want to be in there. You want and you're, I think you're encouraged to like touch and talk and figure out your project there. Um, but as well, they're in department stores. Like yarn is literally everywhere, which as a knitter, we're here for that. Um, and oh, I do want to talk about the VAT form. I'm going to talk about that, I think, at the end, um, that if you are ever going over, um, hopefully this can help you out and uh, some tidbits to do and not to do for that. Um, we're going to go into day two now of Oslo. So day two, uh, we walked to the palace. There's um, the palace that is located kind of at the top of Karl Johan, uh, which is the main strip, the main street of Oslo. This is the kingdom of the royal family. I don't know if they were physically situated there still. The palace was closed when we were there, but the garden seemed to be open. Uh, we didn't do a tour, obviously, because it was closed and again this is still a country that has a royal family so they work like Canada in that there's a royal family not that we have one like here in Canada in in the UK in London um, that they have a prime minister so this is how their government system works we'll get into the politics of all of that um, but beautiful walk very hot no shade um, then we went to, we, we did this kind of a downtown day so the first day was the Grunoloka area hip cool area this is a downtown core the busier city center um we went to a department store called hyman hoof hoofiden um this is a department store that i found on my own and then i feel like i saw on a couple of like vlogs that i was watching as i was kind of gathering information about norway and oslo and this was a spot that people you know said we should check out I'm trying to see, yes. So this is a department store of um, many that are located not only in the city of Oslo, but all over the country. And they host uh, traditional Norwegian garments, 
so these are you know different dress blouse i'm sure they have all very specific names um i do not know them and i don't i don't want to go there um but as well they have tons of yarn and norwegian heavy yarn so again very norwegian brands are located within the department store the department store is like on top it's like perfumes and you know it's what we'd expect in north america but as you go down on the other floor the second floor we went to the um uh, flagship store in also of this department store uh this is where all the knitting goodness is as well um so they have different national brands as well beautiful displays tons of samples in the department store so different so interesting it was it was awesome um they had a beautiful display for rama's summer release of crochet i don't know the designer or designers behind it but i just felt i'm like this just came out days before we left i saw my instagram feed and here i am seeing samples like we don't have this in north america it was so cool so neat um yes then from there, um, I went to a sewing store in the core called Sun, oh gosh, uh, Sun Sen Let Letret. I might have even spelled it wrong. Um, it was a sewing shop on the corner in this downtown area. And I just walked in to see what there would be. Um, in my research, I saw that they would have some yarn as well. So just want to check it out. Again, very Norwegian heavy with Rama, with Sinus, and with, uh, what am I missing? I can't remember the other brand, sorry. Uh, they had a lot of different thick mohairs. So when I'm talking about thick mohairs, I'm not talking about like the lace mohair that you pair with like a fingering arm. This is mohair that you hold single. And this I was seeing on a lot of girls and women uh, that were walking around also in handmade sweaters. Handmade sweaters were also a big thing. There was a bit of a sweater parade going on, um, even though the weather was mostly 30 in the day, but it did cool down at night. <clears throat> it was awesome to see handmade sweaters out in the wild because again, we don't really see that until for me, unless I'm at the yarn shop or a yarn event. So that was great. Um, they also had a lot of cotton yarns, beautiful ribbons. And it was just, yeah, it was a delight. <clears throat> what I did there is I just made a really small purchase of this bag that has been through a battle. And um, really simple purchase. It is cording. So this is just the um, putting yarn on hold kind of cording. They sold it by the meterage. Uh, off of a spool and you just got whatever amount cut that you would want uh, I think I got three meters if I'm not mistaken in my memory and I think when I did the conversion it was crazy I think it was under like five dollars I could be wrong I can't remember I don't have my um chit in front of me but if you are North America you know the barber cords have like three kind of like strings of sets of this guy it's like the tubing and it's like I don't know $17 now it's not cheap and so I thought wow like to get <laughs> to get all of this for like five dollars Canadian yes please could have got could have got the whole spool sorry big noises um so that was kind of a good find felt like that was a bargain <laughs> good job bargain in um in Norway yeah it's really cute sewing shop uh they did have lots of fabric didn't bring any of that home but cool all right so that was day oh, i'm almost missing the activity day two activity day two activity was recommended to me by a lovely viewer and said you should totally do this this is a one regret i have not doing it was the floating sauna experience I was talking to the love of my life back here before we left to say we should book this. I really think this is a great idea. And he was like, you know what? I'm going to let you enjoy that. I'm going to go do my own thing. And so I thought, I'm going to do it. I'm an independent girl. Like, okay. I booked the floating sauna experience with cock. Okay. <laughs> K, K okay. Um, they are a private i believe a private company um that has three different sauna experiences now let me let me share that also has become i think it was like 12 years ago if i if i read correctly a sauna culture 
in the city center. So when we're looking at the land trap of Oslo, or sorry, Norway, Oslo is at the bottom here, maybe here. Um, they're situated in a fjord, if you remember when I was talking about the fortress. Um, in that field, it's a, so it's a beautiful city with greenery and hills, probably mountains, mountains around um, on water, on salt water. <laughs> like this is coming in from the ocean. Beautiful setting. So what they've decided to do on these um, piers is they've created or allowed companies to create floating saunas in different specific sections. It's, I feel like it's very regulated. So they've got th different options. You can become a member if you, I guess, live there and it makes sense. So apparently it's very common to have a work day. And then as a member, you go and you enjoy the sauna. Like, that's amazing. Um, as someone who doesn't live there, you can book one of three experiences with uh, these companies. So I just want to see where that is. And I don't know where my notes are. Here it is. Yes. Um, so I booked with Kok, K O K, um, at the location of Lang, Langkaya. Uh, they have two locations. One is there, and and one is um, another area that is not as central. But I didn't write it down. Um, and then they have three different experiences that you can choose. So one is a private sauna where you can book for up to like eight or 10 people. One is a cruise sauna, where it's exactly what it sounds like. It's crazy, we saw it. It's literally the boxy sauna that goes tuk, 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 with a motor and they have, I guess, some captain on there. And you go and you visit, there's islands, so you visit an island or two or whatever and then come back. So it's literally your sauna is moving along the fjord as your sauna ing. That's cool. A little more expensive and um, and then the option that i chose which was the shared experience sauna it's floating but it's like anchored in or hooked into the dock off of the main like you're in the main strip of also right in the city center in the fjord um that's what i chose so that hosts up to eight people so i went with the little guide of note of like this is what you could do or bring to prepare and i did and uh, it was such a fabulous experience. So I said ciao to the love of my life. I brought two towels from the hotel that they allowed me to borrow, which was amazing. A water bottle that I filled and I wore my bathing suit. So I wore it already with clothing over top because the change room is open. It's like one room within the sauna or like sectioned off by the wall, but it's co-ed. Um, so if you're not super comfortable changing in front of different people that are strangers, um, maybe that could be an option for you and wear your bathing suit under. Um, it was so great. We had two other couples. So it was five of us, just me. And then there was a couple from UK. There was a couple from Ottawa, Canada, believe it or not, young couple. And uh, we had a glorious time. I hit it off right away with what the lady uh, that I met from just outside of London. She was amazing. And uh, we chatted the whole time. So for us, which I was fine with, it was not a relaxing experience. It was a fun experience. And I think maybe I, I felt like that was the vibe that they had wanted as well. They were runners and they were actually visiting Norway because they did a midnight summer run up in the north. So they were they were cool. They were, they're my people. Um, yeah, so we were a little hesitant, her and I, to jump in the fjord. Everyone else seemed like, you know, because you're, you're hot, you're sweating in the sauna, you're adding the water in, it's beautiful. It's already 30 degrees out, mind you. Um, so you can venture physically outside of your sauna and go into the fjord, which is cold, like really cold water. People do this in the winter with ice. Um, Canadians do this too. They call them polar dips. Not my thing. I'm a thermophile through and through. I like warm and heat, hence knitting and sweaters. I jumped in. I did jump in myself and my new best friend that we were there in the sauna with. We decided to go in. She went down on the ladder, very graceful, classy woman, not me. I just jump in and got her and we're done with. And it, it wasn't that bad. I think it wasn't as crazy cold as I had imagined because we were coming in from the sauna. The sauna was like crazy hot. I also have been in way colder water in Ontario. Uh, in the lakes, like in the early spring, which is just horrific and it takes your breath away. It's awful. This wasn't that bad. 
I think it's because it's summer maybe. I mean, I wouldn't do it in the winter. Um, it was the best time. It was the best time. Um, anything else I want to share about that? I kept my bathing suit on after as well. Uh, I didn't think my friends needed to see my bits and bobs. So I just put clothes on over top of my bathing suit, walked back to the hotel, which was very close and uh, prepared for dinner there. I did it late afternoon. So I picked, I think it was a 3.45 mark uh, in the afternoon. And it was just the most brilliant time to have done it because you know, it was kind of in that lull. I find when I go on vacation, that lull in the afternoon that happens where you're just like, you've done all your activities of the day. You're in this tired, you kind of need a tea or a snack mode, and then you're ready for dinner and cocktails. That's when I did it. And I felt like it was just awesome. Great time. Super, super fun. Um, that was a floating sauna. So thank you. There were actually two people that reached out to say that I should do the floating sauna. And I think for sure, other than the yarn experience and also I think that was my top highlight activity. It was amazing. Side note as well, there were people that were taking pictures or and videos of us as we were coming out of the saunas and jumping into the fjords. That I felt a little weird about, but at the same time in Toronto as I'm walking around, people like tourists take video and photo all the time with faces that are there. So it, anyway. It depends what you're going after, but there are other locations that are a little more discreet and private. So just saying, but if you are ever finding yourself to do a floating song experience, you have to do it. It was awesome. So that in general was day two. We're going to get into day three, which technically was the day four because I didn't count the first day. And this will be the last day that I talk about in also, which was definitely one of my favorites. Um, so day three. Oh my gosh, no, two more days. <laughs> <laughs> there are two more days I've written down. Um, the third day was, I swear, the hottest day. It was definitely in the 30 degree mark, very hot. Um, and for all you US folks, Fahrenheit, that's like hot. I don't know what it is. It's it's like steamy, steamy. Um, I walked from the downtown center to Garntopia. Garntopia was my number one yarn shop that I wanted to attend in Oslo. Um, they were definitely on my list. I had found them on Instagram a couple years ago and fell in love with their content. And so the expectations I had were like here, <laughs> they were, they were high. Um, it didn't disappoint. First of all, if you were planning on ever doing this, um, and it's a crazy hot day, be prepared. There's not a lot of shade. Um, I, I wore a hat, I wore sunglasses. I mean, I normally cover up pretty well in public in the sun. This this was a spicy meatball. Um, it was a lot. I have to go soon, I'm meeting a friend. Oh my gosh, I'm chatting so much. Okay, um, anyway, <sighs> Gardentopia. Uh, I got there after an hour of walking in the sun. Before that, I did stop off at a cafe called Frugen Cafe. It's a very residential area. There's a couple locations. One is kind of more central area. This one was on route, so I thought perfect. So we actually got an iced latte, sat in house, did some knitting, loved it. And uh, it was a busy little spot. I got a um, iced uh, latte there and a canal snoorer. It's a cinnamon bun, <laughs> probably say it totally wrong. It's very nice. It's knotted cinnamon bun, very cinnamon heavy, not heavy on the sweetness. So that was lovely. Um, and yes, that gave me the power to press on to Garntopia. Garntopia was fab. I chatted with the ladies, there was one in particular that I love so much. She was so helpful. Um, it is in the area of Ensio. Uh, which is outside the city center. That is where I saw as you're leaving the city center, um, there are arms, like full on, you know, parking arms that come up and down, monitored with video for cars going in and out of the city with the assumption that they get tracked and charged for driving into the city, which I've heard other cities do as well, which is my proposal as to why the city wasn't rampant with traffic like Toronto fabulous idea. It really limited the amount of cars going in because I think it's probably so expensive, um, which I'm here for because cities in the, like cars in the city, it is a lot. Um, pedestrians can find it challenging as bikers and anyway, won't get into that. So, uh, yes, Gartopia had Rama, Sanis, Isayer, 
Um, tons of knitting for all of beautiful displays, ton, ton, tons of samples, um, accessories as well. They had Filklana, Camera Rose, fabulous. I could, I did, I spent at least two, two and a half hours in there. Um, here is what I purchased. This, I have purchased this name that I'm gonna be very challenged in saying. Um, I bought a sweater quantity. I won't show you all of them right now. Um, I'm going to try to say it's uh, Heil Holtz uh, Old Spinnery. Uh, that is the maker, um, and it is the actual hand Vekergam. That was pretty good. Like I feel pretty good about that. Um, this I purchased from Garntopia. I did purchase, as I said, a sweater quantity. Yes, somehow magically I fit it into my backpack. I really don't know how I did, along with three skeins of Storm over there. Um, I am just so jazzed about this. This is not a Norwegian yarn. This is a Danish yarn. And actually going further into the research I did after I purchased, it's even less Danish than I thought, but it's fabulous. Um, Petite Knit has designed a couple of her sweaters using this base. This is not why I got it. I purchased this yarn because I do not believe I can get this within Canada or at least in Toronto. I've never seen this in a shop and I thought, well, I'm there. Then I don't have to pay shipping and it's stunning. Um, I got a very light colorway. I was really undecided on what I wanted. They have beautiful dyed colors and the natural colorways as well. I actually, in choosing this, um, the lovely lady I was working with in the shop said this is actually the most popular color. I think also because apparently Petite Knit has designed exactly with this color in some of her pullover sweater designs. Um, but I love it, I love it, I love it. It's super soft, but with a rustic hint, like a nod to rustic. In the research I did about this yarn, um, this is, blah, 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 blah. Uh, yes, it's a Danish yarn. It is in the color 23 or sand, from what I saw on the band. Um, it is a blend of Gotland and Merino. So again, no Norwegian or Danish bits, I guess. Um, in moving further, uh, I learned that this yarn blend is actually from the Folk Islands, which is not even near Denmark, <laughs> but I mean, it's beautiful. So interesting. I'm really happy I purchased it. Not so much a local yarn, but a great memory because it was definitely a feat to get to the yarn shop for pressing over an hour in the heat and I was really happy and I walked back too by the way so technically two hour two hour hike to and from Garntopia um yes I also learned side note at the yarn shop from the lovely ladies there because I was talking about like we can't get our hands on patterns from Rama or Sanis a lot of the time here in North America and what's up with that basically it's a yarn company choice traditionally yarn companies um, basically couple yarn purchases with pattern so they only offer pattern purchases with their yarn purchase so you have to purchase a quantity of their yarn it doesn't even have to be the yarn that's called for in the pattern they basically want to guarantee that they are selling their their yarn their product to you so i did try to see if i wanted to purchase some yarn um, to get a pattern and I didn't just because again, I was purchasing so much. I had this on my wish list before I left. And so I was holding off as well as you're gonna be finding in future episodes, there's more. Um, right, that was uh, Garntopia. That was the beginning of the day. I tried to do that. Uh, then um, in the afternoon, much later in cooling off, uh, the love of my life and I met up and we walked along the opera house or so up to the opera house at the opera house um, which is located right on the fjord center of the city on the water beautiful location stunning modern design of glass and um, marble I think it's a marble uh, they have the opera house accessible to walk up um, it was amazing I mean so cool to have a building where you can access outside and in uh, so we did a little walk up 
to have a view of the city and the fjord. It was beautiful, uh, very touristy, as it like it makes sense. It was awesome. Uh, yes, and there are funny little steps that are not highlighted because, again, the aesthetic is that uh, they want the marble to be the highlight in the feature. So there's funny little steps up or different, like, non-joins of the marble as you're walking. And for me, because I'm always looking at everything, um, we stumbled a couple times. So just be careful about that if you ever venture up to the opera house. Um, and then we finished off the evening at Cafe Skansen. Cafe Skansen is an old, I don't know the oldest, but a very old uh, cafe restaurant uh, in the core. Uh, it is a Norwegian cafe serving up the quote, modern Scandinavian cuisine. Um, and it steps away from other Michelin star restaurants. So it's in this really stunning area. There's a park beside it, the Contra uh, Skjøget Park. I'm sure I'm not saying it right. But at the time, there was a music festival going on uh, right beside. So it was a hot spot. We sat outside. We enjoyed people watching. We didn't make a reservation. Um, we were just kind of hanging out until we came in. I was knitting, of course, in line, which was totally cool, and people watching, which was great because it was a parade of sweaters. These people that went to the music festival, which was mostly like young crowd, I'd say like 20s-ish, um, instead of wearing like the bra tops and the cutoff shorts with things all everywhere, they were wearing beautiful hand knits over their shoulders with blouses and what and um full pants beautiful skirts and dresses which was exactly what we were seeing um on people in general on the streets um but this was going to a music festival so it was just again a big cultural difference of the beauty piece the aesthetic piece the um, modest piece as well i loved it i thought everyone looked fabulous um so that was the cafe skansen delicious food very busy, very busy there. Um, and then day four, I do have to talk about this in a second cut. I need to meet up with my friend and I'm already three minutes late leaving. So technically I tried to do this in one shot and there, there's more coming at you. And I have to get to day four, which was a beautiful last day for us and two fabulous highlights. So stay tuned. Well, hello. We are going through our final day, day four of Oslo, before pressing on to other parts of Norway. On this day, it was a really hot, sun-drenched day. Um, we had decided to attend the Norwegian Museum of Cultural History, also called the Norsk uh, Folk Museum. This was a bus ride away. It was one bus only to get there from the city center, super easy to get to without a car, and it was fantastic. Originally, I had wanted to go to the Viking Museum, which is located in a very similar area, almost, I think, you know, the, the borders are touching a property. Um, however, the Viking Museum is closed under renovation until 2026, so, we will have our hearts set on it for another time. Um, in the meantime, we did attend uh, the Museum of Cultural History and it was lovely. Uh, so this is an open air museum that features buildings from across the ages of Norway that backdate um, from uh, 1500, which again in Canadian terms is very, very long. We're a new country um, and it was fantastic. When we arrived, we had purchased our tickets and then we were able to get a group tour. There's two tour uh, languages from what I read, Norwegian tour and an English tour. We of course chose our English tour and it was a packed tour. Within our tour group, we had everyone from senior age to children and our tour guide who spoke perfect English 
um, was super informative, very charismatic, really spoke to the group really well. Um, informative, of course, but really played to the variety of ages that were within our tour group. She was lovely. Uh, the tour guide and then all of the people on site within the building areas. Um, and there's there's tons of 160 buildings, um, people that are there as part of the museum. They're wearing um, date appropriate attire to go with the building era that they're around which I thought was fabulous um, so again these are these are buildings that have been collected uh, from across the country in Norway and transported and rebuilt um, or put back together uh, at this museum so this reminded me of Ontario we have a Black Creek Pioneer Village similar idea um, one of the buildings that you may recognize or may have heard of perhaps because it's the most famous is the Gold Stave or Stav Church. This is a church originally from 1200s um, but had burnt down and so was rebuilt and it was rebuilt in 18... 84 apparently as an exact replica of the original I, I don't know if this is true this is what I read um, and it's a beautiful wooden church um, medieval with a nod to I believe the Viking times from from my memory of the tour group it had undergone various religions um, that practiced within that one church um, so I think really showed the history over time with different additions or changes that happened um, within the church itself. It was beautiful. Along with the church there or, or and buildings, um, there's exhibits as well within the museum grounds. One of which we went through quite extensively was an exhibit of the Sami culture or the Sami people. And this is an Aboriginal group of Norway. Um, very interesting, of course. Uh, there was also featured a long route, um, and we were there for quite some time perusing uh, folk dancers. So they have dancers that display and participate in um, different cultural dances of Norway. And uh, music, of course, the full garb as well. And there is some farm animals as well as you go through the different sites and buildings that would be, um, I would say native, native to the country, but we know farm animals are never really totally native. Um, this included the Old Norse sheep and a certain pig. I don't know what kind of breed of pig it is. I'm not a pig knower. Um, but loved it and I loved seeing the Old Norsk sheep, which is the Old Norwegian breed of sheep. Um, very cool, slightly smaller than I expected and um, a curly, curly uh, wool, can I say. Uh, the coats were curlier than I had imagined and I've seen in other breeds that I've seen in Ontario. Um, so in general, that was the museum. It was fantastic. I ended up from there. Oh, I did do something else this day. I forgot about this and I did do another yarn shop. My goodness. Yes, I did. Um, so we got back on the bus together. Uh, Love My Life was a little overheated. So he went back to the hotel to literally chill out. I continued on route. Um, I got off the bus at a certain point and then did a big walk. And I walked up to, it was called... <clears throat> totally cheated and I looked it up because I didn't write it down. I walked all the way to Strik Fiba. Uh, this was a yarn shop that was recommended to find hand dyed yarn and I did. Uh, this is a hand dyed, high hand dyer, hand dyed yarn shop mostly. They had some non hand dyed items but again being summer it was a lot of cotton, cotton yarns, a lot of crochet-esque things. Um, I don't think I took footage here. I'll include it if I did. Um, but the hand dyed yarn that I was looking for, it 
wasn't as hand dye y as I had wanted. It was hand dyed mohair, mostly one color, like one saturated color, and uh, boucle. They had a boucle as well. Um, so it didn't really fit the bill for what I was looking for. Uh, they did have great accessories and quilted, like already made quilted items. Um, they looked very handmade. Um, they, it was jackets and vests, and beautiful, uh, not inexpensive, but interesting. So I had done a really big walk in the heat with little success, but was interested and happy that I had ventured out to this yarn shop as well. And I can definitely see in the winter how it would be fantastic with different options of more yarny type goodness, wooly bits, I'll say. Um, and so that was our day four wrap up. Again, it was a lot of adventure and super fun. And uh, that was also so many highlights I feel because obviously there was so much to be done that I do feel like I'll have to return one day um, to the city um, and enjoy more. Uh, it was a great, I'll say like taste of the city for sure. I think we definitely stayed busy every day. Um, I felt like I ventured um, as much as I could and uh, yeah, it was great. I can't wait to go back. Um, so coming up in part two will be the Sturvanger experience um, and Bergen as well. Uh, we also, and I'll just prepare you a little bit. Um, we had a couple days as well in Zurich, Switzerland. So this is where we flew out of and that is our trip. Um, but I felt like there's just so much to talk about and so much goodness. So I definitely felt the need to give it a chunk. I do want to talk quickly about the VAT um, tax return, if you will. Um, I had watched, um, Knee Knits or N-E Knits. Um, she is a fabulous podcaster and knitter from the United States and she had gone on a work trip uh, to Norway. She was obviously into the yarny goodness and had mentioned about if a certain amount is spent um, that you are bringing back on products with you from Norway that you can apply for a refund, a tax refund, because tax taxation is quite high in Norway. Again, it's very social and understood. So taxation on products is 25%, I believe, um, which is high. In Ontario, we're 13%. It depends on the goods. Um, so what I did is for the bigger yarn purchases that I had well in Norway, um, I had the yarn shops fill out a paper form and I'll be careful because I don't know if my information's on here, but I don't think it is. Um, so each yarn shop fills out a paper form of how much money you spent um, in Norwegian kroners and then how much money you could get back through this refund policy that takes place. Um, they also tell you to hold on to your receipt because you also have to submit that as well when you get uh, your your forms certified. Um, what I will say is I was very diligent about getting the forms done and keeping the receipts all together in one little clean package. Um, here's where I failed, and so this is my message to you, is that you actually have to get your package of tax refunded forms or your VAT forms certified before you leave the country. I didn't do this and only realized after I was um, distracted by baked goods being made in the airport of Bergen before we left. We arrive early to the airport very early every time just so that we have that time to chill and if there's any kind of hiccups that we can deal with it 
and not have to like race through the terminals. Um, the Bergen Airport's very small and this was our last airport before leaving into Switzerland. I'm telling you this as well because I'll, I'll recap as I go and do my second part of Norway. Um, you have to get the uh, VAT forms validated at specific locations in the country before you leave. Um, and the airports is one location that you can do that. Again, I was distracted by baked goods because they were actually making baked goods on site in the airport. It was fresh and delightful. I actually don't work at a minute of it. And I had a beautiful homemade good in the airport that was freshly made. Anyway, we'll get to that in the Bergen uh, component of Norway. But um, yes, if you're going to Norway, consider getting a VAT form, but definitely make sure that you get it validated before leaving. All right, that is it for Norway part one. I so appreciate you joining me. And as always, if you enjoyed the episode, found it interesting, maybe learned a little something or are a little bit tickled about more travel, please uh, like and subscribe to the channel. And I definitely invite you to consider clicking down into the Ko-Fi link where there you can click and consider donating a coffee to myself. Thank you to people who have already had that ability to click and donate um, a coffee to myself. So thank you so much for that. And I think that is that. So until next time, wishing you great joy in your knitting. And if you are traveling, even if it's to a coffee shop, I hope you very much enjoy. And until next time, take care.